Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Grace Bible Church Online Edition. I'd like to invite you to open up your Bible to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. Last week we started looking at verses 15 through 23, and this morning we're going to finish up that section. And last week as we started looking at the person of Jesus Christ, we were confronted with the importance of truly knowing Christ, of embracing the right Jesus. That getting the identity of Jesus right is of critical importance, impacting not only this life, but all of eternity. That to not get Jesus right impacts salvation, forgiveness of sins, fellowship with God, freedom of condemnation, eternal life, Jesus, he is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Everything is built upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. And if you remember in Paul's prayer in verse 12, he speaks of giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, knowing that God the Father rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And when we looked at that, I mentioned that is a reality that is currently true, that we have been transferred, yet will be realized fully when Jesus returns, establishing his throne on earth. And following this reality for which Paul is giving thanks, he quickly transitions into this discourse regarding the preeminence of Jesus, the greatness of Jesus Christ. We see in this section the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. Jesus is the king of the kingdom we have been transferred to. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the preeminent one over all of creation, and he is not only preeminent over creation, but of the spiritual realm as well. He is the head of the church and gives perfect direction and leadership and life and power to the body. That is the church. There's no greater authority to be under than Jesus' authority, and all authority is his. He is supreme above all creation as the creator and sustainer of everything. There is no greater master, no better Lord, no more sovereign king, no more powerful God. There is nothing we need that Jesus lacks. He is fully supreme in every way and sufficient for our every true need. And in scripture, we see his wonderful provisions for his people through various graces he affords his people. And I believe every believer at Grace Bible Church would agree with these statements regarding Jesus. Yet where I believe we are challenged by these truths is not in the mental understanding or affirmation, but in the practical practice of these truths. Does our responses to life's various hardships reflect a belief in these truths? Does our response to the start of our kids' school being postponed demonstrate an unwavering belief in the sovereignty and preeminence of Jesus? How about our response to social media? How about our response to reports of COVID-19 or social injustices or difficult relationships or taxing work situations, personal struggles over sin, doctor reports, medical results, mandatory mask usage orders, personal struggles, as I said, over sin, news of temporary live stream church services again, does our response to all of these things flow through our deep-rooted conviction that Jesus is the preeminent one over all of creation and our conviction that Jesus is also preeminent over all spiritual realities and that he is trustworthy? Do we respond to these seeking to be faithful to Christ as the sovereign ruler, or do we respond to these circumstances seeking to supplant Christ by not focusing on the holiness, our holiness, of our personal responses, but seeking to control our circumstances? 
You see, what we truly believe, what we truly believe and hold to will have an impact on how we live. And if we truly understand the reality of Jesus' supremacy and and sufficiency, we will be fortified in our faith and enabled toward faithfulness as we embrace these realities of who Jesus Christ is. So with these things in mind, being reminded of the importance of knowing Jesus, let us read together this wonderful discourse setting forth the greatness of Jesus. Colossians 1, we're going to start in verse 15 and do a brief review of what we covered last week, and then we'll pick up this morning in the second half of verse 18. So starting in verse 15, Paul says regarding Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And then our section for this morning And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds... Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in scripture that we might know you. And I pray that this morning as we dive into this section that we would have humble hearts to receive the truth, the realities of who Christ is, and that we would worship in response to his greatness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In these verses we are looking at today, Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul sets forth the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. Jesus is supreme over everything. And in so being supreme, what we're going to look at this morning is the reality he is also the source of reconciliation. Jesus' supremacy and sufficiency are expressed in four realities Jesus' supremacy and sufficiency are expressed in four realities. Four realities of who Jesus is are unpacked that demonstrate his supremacy and sufficiency. Jesus' supremacy and sufficiency are expressed in these four realities. Last week we covered the first three, and we saw that verses 15 and 16 demonstrate that Jesus is the preeminent one over creation. He is the image of God. He is God in the flesh. And in so being, he is preeminent over all of creation. And when Paul says firstborn, he is clearly, clearly referring not to sequential order, but supremacy. He has the ultimate right over all of creation. He, Jesus, as the creator of all things and the end of that creation is supreme over all. So first, we saw Jesus is the preeminent one over creation. In verse 17, we saw that Jesus is the eternal sustainer of all things. Jesus is the eternal sustainer. And then as we saw that, we saw that he is not only the creator and ruler and end of all things, but he is actually sustaining all things by his power. Everything owes its created existence and sustained existence to Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we saw in verse 18, the beginning, that Jesus is the head of the church. 
Jesus is the head of the church. This describes the unique and precious relationship that Jesus has with his church. And in this imagery of Jesus as the head, we understand that the head represents authority and direction and control over, and that is Jesus' right position over his church. Well, this morning we're going to look at number four, and that is this reality regarding Jesus, and it is that Jesus is the exclusive means of reconciliation. So number four, Jesus is the exclusive means of reconciliation. Now, as we've been making our way through this passage, seeing the supreme authority and power of Jesus Christ, you might be wondering, wait a minute, if Jesus is so powerful, if Jesus is sustaining all things with his power, and if he is supreme over all things, why is this world like it is today? Why does sin still exist? Why is rebellion still allowed? Why does death and sickness still take effect today? And these are valid questions to ponder. And Paul, as he continues to speak to the person and work of Jesus, is going to actually bring clarity to those questions as he demonstrates the reality that Jesus is the exclusive means of reconciliation. Things spiritually are not as uncertain as they may at times feel. This passage we've been working through has been believed by many to be a hymn that was sung by the early church. And whether or not that is true is not particularly consequential. But the reason this is believed by some is because of the structure of the passage. It has a very intentional and almost poetic structure, and it's a little more difficult to see in the English, but I want to talk through it for a moment because I believe it'll help bring clarity. It's it's significant for understanding the flow of the text, and I think it'll help us as we work our way through this. So look for a moment at verse 15. Look back at verse 15. We see the statement, he is the image of the invisible God. And then a statement in apposition, right? We talked about that last week in apposition. That is, it's a clarifying restatement of the first statement. So he is the image of the invisible God. And then the statement in apposition or clarifying that statement Paul makes is that he is the firstborn of all creation. Do you see that there in verse 15? Well, in the original, the pronoun he that we see in the beginning of that verse is actually better translated as who, who. And Paul isn't asking a question, but referencing the beloved son, who is the image, and then he goes on to explain. And then in verse 17, we see these emphatic statements where the pronoun he is used, and we discuss that it is a he himself, or he and exclusively he is before all things. And in verse 18, he, or he himself, or he exclusively is the head of the church. Well, in the second half of verse 18, in the middle of the verse where he says, and he is the beginning, do you see that in verse 18? and he is the beginning, we actually see Paul reverting back to using the pronoun who. Who is the beginning? Then again, an appositional statement, the firstborn from the dead, and then an explanation. Uh, To show this relationship, I want to put something on the screen for you. I'm a visual learning learner. It helps me in learning to, to see things. And hopefully this will be helpful for you to see the flow of the passage. So you see that there. He or who is the image of the invisible God. And then the statement clarifying that, the firstborn of all creation. And then Paul gives explanation for by all things, for by him, all things were created. Verse 17, he is before all things. Verse 18, he is the head of the body. And then our section this morning, verse 18, second half, who is the beginning? He or who is the beginning? And then the appositional statement, the firstborn from the dead. And then Paul goes on to give explanation so that he himself will come to have first place in everything and so on. Now, Do you see the parallelism or similar nature of the statement in verse 15 and the statement in verse 18? This shows that there are primarily two sections in this discourse on the person of Christ. Christ. 
Paul has been talking about Jesus' supremacy over all creation, his divine power, and now he's going to talk about Jesus' sufficiency as the supreme reconciler of all things. So Jesus is the reconciler of all things, and we see this unfold as we see Paul set forth Jesus' preeminence over death. So, number four, Jesus is the exclusive means of reconciliation, and we see that broken down as Jesus' preeminence over death enables him to two things. First, to reconcile all of creation unto the Father, and secondly, to reconcile now believers into fellowship. And we're going to break each one of those down. But first, we need to understand Jesus' preeminence over death. And that's in verse 18 and 19. So let's talk about Jesus' preeminence over death and all that that means about who he is. Look again at the middle of verse 18. He or as we just discussed, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, in what way is Jesus the beginning? This word carries the idea of primacy or rule. It can be used to refer to a physical starting place or can be used to reference uh, time or a position of power. Now, as before in verse 15, the following statement gives clarity to the former in how it is being used. When Paul says he is the firstborn from the dead, we find that this statement gives clarity to the former. So in what way is Jesus the firstborn from the dead? Well, in verse 15, Paul uses this same firstborn language to talk about Jesus' preeminence over creation. He wasn't speaking of order, but primacy. He is supreme of all creation. There is nothing in this passage now, as we consider verse 15, there's nothing in our passage this morning that would cause us to take the same language and view it differently than how Paul already used it. Thus, in the statement, Paul is not drawing attention to the order of Jesus being brought or raised from the dead, but that he is the preeminent one reigning over death. He is the firstborn out of the dead, meaning he was once in the category of one who was dead, yet in his resurrection, he now rules over death. Christ rules over death because he conquered death. You see, when Jesus created the world, death was not a part of it. It was not a part of his original creation. Yet when man sinned, death was brought into the world. The world went from being good to being cursed. Since that time, all things have not been in harmony under God's rule as he originally created it. God is still sovereign. Nothing is happening outside of his rule. Everything is being sustained by Christ, yet everything is not as it was prior to sin entering the world, and everything is not as it will be. As an effect of the fall, creation groans, waiting for God to set things right. Creation groans, things die. Yet Jesus' resurrection gave to him the right as the one supreme over death to rule over death. Jesus now rules over death and can deliver from it. And as 1 Corinthians 15, 16 says, the last enemy that he will conquer is death. He is now supreme over death, and there is a coming day where he will finally and completely do away with death. Jesus, as the firstborn from the dead, the preeminent one from death, reigns supremely and has the right to bring deliverance from death and the curse of sin. This was God's plan from the beginning. God, in his justice and righteousness, had to deal with sin. And no one other than Jesus could do this. Only the death of Jesus satisfied God's holy, righteous wrath. And only by the Messiah's, the Christ's victory over death, could death be defeated. Jesus, as his body was raised, claimed victory over death and the curse of death. And Jesus emerged from the grave, not only savior of the redeemed, but as the one who rules over the realm of the dead. Jesus 
He delivers sinners from the judgment and punishment their sin deserves. He forgives. He redeems. He grants life, but he also now in this holds the power over sin and, effect, and the effects of sin and the disorder sin has brought into the world and through his preeminent position over this holds the power to reconcile all things to himself as we'll see in just a few moments. Now, in light of this, in what way is Jesus the beginning? Well, he is the beginning in that he is the source, the supreme one over death and the sole victor and ruler over death. All of God's work in bringing creation back to its proper place originates out of and begins with Jesus. That is how he is the beginning. All of God's work in bringing creation back to its proper place originates, begins with Jesus. He is the beginning. The beginning of this victorious work. He is the firstborn from the dead, the victor over our ultimate enemy. And then Paul tells us why. He tells us why. Look at the end of verse 18. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Jesus was preeminent over all of creation, yet through this work, his preeminence has gone even further. Sin and the domain of darkness has now been conquered by Jesus. Sin's curse on the world, Satan, demons, sinful humanity, all that is living every moment in rebellion against Jesus, all that seeks to rebel against his rule, all that seeks to suppress the truth about God and take glory away from him. The whole world of sin is defeated by Christ's victory over death. Christ came as a man. He endured all of our temptations. He was completely sinless. Then he willingly went to the cross, laying down his life where each one of us has failed in our sin. Jesus was sinless. Yet he bore the wrath of God. He bore the sin, the judgment, the wrath for all who would believe. He, the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, he rendered powerless. He, he gave his life as a ransom for many, and he, as the perfect sacrifice, rendered Satan powerless. Hebrews 2 tells us he rendered powerless the one who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And in so doing this, he demonstrated himself to be preeminent over death, supreme over death. And as Paul goes on to say, referencing Jesus' death in Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, that he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he is now victorious over the domain of death and sin. And in this, Jesus is now preeminent in every arena of his creation. Jesus Christ is supreme over all. Even over the domain of darkness, over sin itself. Yet in this arena, it is not because he is the originator of it, but because he is the conqueror over it. That is our Savior. That is our Lord. That is Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought that Jesus' work on the cross was primarily about his salvation of sinners? It is true, that is a critical part of it, but Jesus conquering death is far bigger than that. It is about Jesus reigning supreme over absolutely everything, including sin and death. 
You see, our salvation is not rooted in how important we are, but the preeminence of Jesus in every area. And we get infinite benefit through grace and mercy to be a part of Jesus' work. It truly is astonishing. Next, Paul says in verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now, some have understood this passage to be another reference to Christ's deity. Again, context is going to be so helpful for us to understand what Paul is saying. This idea Paul sets forth of the Father's pleasure or being pleased, it always carries with it the choice to give status to. These words that Paul uses for the father being pleased, it always carries with it the idea of a choice to give status to. That's the way that it was pleasing. And since that is the case, to understand the fullness to mean deity implies that God chose to give the status of deity to Jesus Christ. And if that's the case, that God chose to give the status of deity to Jesus Christ, then it means Jesus did not always possess that deity. At some point, the Father gave it to him, which then means Jesus was not eternally God. Now, that is a key view of Arianism, and that is heresy. That is the very belief that Paul is fighting against. Jesus has eternally existed as the second person of the Trinity, always possessing deity. Paul actually specifically addresses the deity of Jesus in chapter 2, verse 9, when he says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus is eternally God. It is his nature that... He is deity, yet it was not something given to him. He always possessed it eternally. So if, if this verse in chapter 1, verse 19, is not a reference to Jesus' deity, what is Paul referencing? What did please the Father to give to Jesus? Well, it is this. All of the conquering of death and preeminence over it Salvation and reconciliation realities meet their fullness or completeness or totality in the person of Jesus. This pleased the Father to have all of God's reconciling and salvation work be in Jesus. We know it was God's plan from the beginning before the world began to bring this to pass through Christ's redemptive work, yet Christ's preeminence over death in verse 18 and Christ's reconciliation of all things, which we'll look at in a moment, sandwich this statement about the Father's pleasure to have the fullness dwell in him, making it clear this fullness is all of the redemptive realities being completed and finding their totality in Jesus. Jesus is preeminent over death. Paul makes that wonderfully clear. And next, as we move to verse 20, we will see that Jesus' preeminence over death enables him unto two things. First, Jesus' preeminence over death enables him to reconcile all of creation unto the Father, Roman numeral one. Jesus' preeminence over death enables him to reconcile all of creation unto the Father. Look again at verse 20. And through him to reconcile, so it was the Father's good pleasure for two things, for all the fullness to dwell in him, dwell in him all of the fullness of the salvation work of Christ, ruling over death, And secondly, to reconcile, or and through him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Well, understanding more fully 
Jesus' preeminence over death and sin will help us understand more completely what his reconciling work has accomplished that we see here in verse 20. It pleased the Father to have the fullness of God's salvific work come through Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself. Now, reconcile means to go from a position of enmity and hostility to a position of friendship or harmony. It is a change in relationship, and Jesus accomplished this reconciliation through the blood of his cross. And you might think, Josh, it doesn't look like all things are reconciled to God. And that's a really good observation. Yet what is truly amazing and captivating in this is that in these statements, Paul is not making reference to the timing of this reconciliation, but the completeness of it. He intentionally uses parts of speech that don't give reference to the timing, but of the definiteness of this reality. Look again at verse 20. He's talking about how it pleased the Father through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace. To reconcile. Now, this is something that was accomplished, yet will be realized at the proper time. Jesus' blood on the cross and victory over the dead granted him the certainty to reconcile all things to the Father in perfect harmony, which we will see. And we will see this upon his return and reign on this earth and realize it in its completion when all evil ones are thrown into the lake of fire. This heaven and earth are burned and the new heaven and the new earth is established where all of creation is returned to perfect harmony under God's rule in peace for eternity. That is truly amazing. And that is the work of Jesus. That's what it means for him to reconcile all things. Paul goes out of his way to show the extent of this reconciliation. He says things in heaven and on earth. Nothing will be allowed to function in hostility towards God, but there will be perfect peace under God's rule. Those unredeemed, the wicked, will no longer be allowed to express their wickedness in hostile rebellion, and those who are redeemed will enjoy sinless fellowship with God forever. This just takes your breath away. It just takes your breath away, the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. This is an unimaginable reality. This is an unimaginable reality that came at an unimaginable cost. And you see it there. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. The blood of Jesus. The humility of this preeminent one. The sacrifice of Christ, it is truly captivating. And through his sacrifice, he reconciles all things to the Father. Astonishing. And that's not all. Verses 21 through 23. He is reconciling all things under his supreme rule, but there is a subcategory of reconciliation, and that's what we'll look at next. Jesus' preeminence over death also enables him to reconcile now believers into fellowship. Uh, look at verse 21, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. 
This hostility, this rebellion, this evil lack of submission towards God and separation from God, Paul says you were formerly there. That was you. Yet he has now in the present order of things, there is a coming reconciliation for all creation under God's reign, but there is a present spiritual reality of reconciliation for believers Jesus reconciled believers now in his fleshly body through death. Jesus, this preeminent one, took on flesh, a fleshly body which is staggering. The incarnation alone is incomprehensible. And yet in his fleshly body through death, he has reconciled all believers to himself. God has. Jesus took upon himself the penalty of the sins for all who would believe and made perfect atonement for those sins. He poured out his blood as the redeemer for for all who would believe in the place of every believer and in so doing took the wrath and the judgment and the penalty of each individual sin for each individual person whom he would save. And he did this for the reason or in order to present. And again, we see this infinitive, this part of speech that Paul specifically uses to reference not the timing, but the reality. For the believer, this will come true. This is a reality for you. You are reconciled now and there will be a day where he will present you. It will happen. It is certain he did this to present or to make known or to render the believer before him. That is God, the father to render the believer before God, the father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Our status as we are set before God because of the work of Jesus is holy. We who are vile, apart from Christ, are viewed as pure in Christ. He says we stand blameless. There is the absence of defect. We are without fault and beyond reproach. There's no accusation that can be brought against Christ's elect. Nothing sticks to us. All because of Jesus' sacrifice. Because of Jesus' blood. Then in verse 23, Paul states, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. The presentation of believers to the Father is now qualified by a conditional statement. Yet in this statement, Paul is making clear that he is is confident that the Colossians will meet this condition. We know that true faith is sustaining faith. And so Paul is encouraging the Colossians to press on in faithfulness. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel, hold fast to Christ. Don't be persuaded to believe less of Christ. Let your understanding of the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus hold you firm in your faith and let it enable or drive you to continued faithfulness. And these realities of Jesus reconciling work is the essence of the gospel that You have heard and believed this gospel that was proclaimed that is going out to all creation under heaven. Paul already referenced this idea in his prayer in verse 6 that the gospel came to the Colossians just as in all the world and it is bearing fruit and increasing. And then Paul says of which he was made a minister and this word for minister was originally used to describe a servant who waited tables and this word's meaning expanded over time and Paul was pleased to use this word to describe his appointment to service of God. Particularly to proclaim this truly amazing and captivating, life-altering, eternally impacting message. Message. 
Christ's preeminence, his supremacy, his sufficiency is truly marvelous. And in him, we have a hope. We have a a hope in this world that this world is not the end. We are reconciled to God through Christ. And we know that what is coming for us is to be presented before the Father as holy and blameless and beyond reproach. We know that Jesus is the sovereign, preeminent one over all of creation. Everything is is created by him, created for him, is sustained by him. And not only that, but death and sin has been conquered by him and he is over those things. And if we hold fast to those realities, how might it impact our endurance, our faithfulness, our holiness as we press on to live for the glory of God. It must impact it. It must. And so we don't live in this life driven by fear or anxiety or worry or concern or even desire to take control of the things around us. Rather, we humbly entrust ourselves to God. We trust Jesus. We recognize his position as supreme over all. And we recognize that our responsibility before him is not to control what's going on around us, but to address what is in us as we live for his glory, seeking to be faithful, seeking to, as Paul prayed already for the Colossians, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus. To have the pattern of our life, the habits of our life be in accordance with who Christ is. As we walk in obedience and holiness and we trust him. As we navigate all the various issues that are before us, we are not to be driven by fear, but by hope, by love in thankfulness. All things will be reconciled into submission to God because of Jesus' work. And the question for each of us that we must consider this morning is, have you been reconciled unto fellowship? Through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the day, from the, from the grave, there is a coming day where all will be reconciled to him, under him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord of all. Have you done that today? Have you been reconciled into fellowship? You must Have you heard, have you not heard the greatness of Christ and through his own blood, through his own sacrifice, he offers reconciliation unto the father through him, fellowship for you with God at the cost of his own blood. Why would we ever, why would anyone ever turn that down? He is so much better than everything. If you have not done that and you consider doing that, submitting your life to Christ, would you reach out to one of the pastors of Grace Bible Church? We would love to hear of your desire. We would love to talk through this with you more. I'd love the opportunity to do that. You can reach out to any of us through the church office. You can call. You can get the number from our website. You can email us at elders at gbcaz.org. We would love to hear from you. Christian, one cannot overstate the infinite worth and the supreme effectiveness of the work of Christ. We must ever keep Christ and his work as the supreme and fully sufficient one before us as we navigate life's various joys and struggles and hardships and temptations that we might continue in the faith of being firmly established and steadfast. We have a certain hope in Christ. And so when executive orders are issued, we trust our Savior. Verse 
with joy. And when pandemics arise, we don't have to fear getting sick. We don't have to fear death. We trust the Lord and we function not out of fear, but out of love, love for our neighbor. Trust in God's sovereign rule as we submit to authorities in an exemplary fashion and we seek to conduct ourselves as we will one day be presented, which is beyond reproach, that we might not bring unnecessary reproach on Christ as we seek to proclaim this precious message to this lost, fallen, rebellious world. No, we trust. We fix our hearts on the hope in the gospel. We press forward in faith, And then as we navigate life's various trials and joys and struggles and hardships and temptations and victories, we continue in the faith being firmly established and steadfast, holding firm the reality of who Christ is, embracing his sufficiency and his supremacy, that we would not be moved away from this hope which is summed up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is supreme. He is sufficient. And as we hold fast to who he is, we will be held firm in our faith and we will be enabled in our faithfulness that we might bring glory and honor to our precious, amazing Savior, Jesus Christ. That we would please him in all respects. That should be our ambition. Let's pray. God, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing the truth, the reality of who you are through scripture that we might know you. And Lord, as we have gazed upon the greatness magnificence of our precious Savior to see him in his splendor. Lord, I pray that we would embrace these truths, that we would not only love and and know these truths intellectually, but we would live faithfully in light of these realities of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished in the gospel that we would truly embrace and believe his preeminence over all things, over all of creation, over sin and death, that we would anticipate and long for that which is coming when all things will be made right, reconciled, holy, perfect to you. Thank you for the certainty of that day that was, is found in Christ and the gospel. Where else would we look? To whom would we give glory? To whom would we praise but in Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, our hope? Father, we pray all of these things in the precious, unparalleled name of Jesus Christ. Amen.